Welcome to Resource on the Go, a podcast from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center on understanding, responding to, and preventing sexual abuse and assault. I'm Sally Lasky, NSVRC's Evaluation Coordinator, and on this episode, you will hear from Strong Oak, a longtime advisor and partner to NSVRC. Strong Oak is one of the co-founders of the Visioning Bear Circle Intertribal Coalition, which is a survivor-led organization based in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. The mission of the coalition is to prevent domestic and sexual violence and other interpersonal violence in tribal, intertribal, and multicultural communities in the Northeast, which includes Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, my home state of Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York, as well as nationally. Strong Oak shares information and lessons about the process of building on a principles focus evaluation approach for their walking in balance with all our relations primary prevention curriculum. Strong Oak, it is so lovely to have you on the NSVRC podcast. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a survivor of both domestic and sexual violence and childhood sexual assault. And I've been plunged into this work for over 50 years. I started out as a journalism major, but the universe decided that um, seeking the... the, um, prevention of violence towards uh, children and families has apparently been my calling. And through that time, uh, finding ways for indigenous people to have services and interventions and prevention initiatives that were specific to our community was a long journey and didn't really um, come into fruition until the birth of the Visioning Bear Circle and the Tribal Coalition in 2015. That's when we got our 501c3. It was a pregnancy because in October of 2014, we we submitted it to the IRS. Okay. (laughs) Or decided to actually, um, you know, go that route after we actually incorporated with the state of Massachusetts. And then in um, October is when we submitted it that was a nine month process because we didn't know what we would do with a hierarchy if we didn't want to have to form one. So we found a way to truly be true to circle practices and still be a 501c3. Yeah. Well, you've been able, I think, to share a lot of information about walking in balance with all our relations over the years as it's been developing. Um, And we'll share in the show notes information from previous presentations Mm -hmm. and meetings. Um, And there's also this case study that you worked with the NSVRC around. Uh, So we'll put those links in our show notes. But I'm wondering, before we jump in to talking a little bit more about how your evaluation process has evolved, could you just share a little bit more about the program? Well, one of the things I'll say is um, this prevention initiative was itself a long process of birthing. We realized that we really couldn't deal effectively in our community around prevention or intervention with the mainstream uh, organizations. So, and we, we wondered what was wrong with this picture. And then we decided that what's wrong with the picture is we needed to go back before the colonists or settlers came here and look at what the values were in order to reclaim our culture and have ways of intervening that were based on our practices. So we'd always uh, been involved in circle practice. So now in hindsight, I wonder, why didn't we start with that to begin with? But we didn't, we were in a mainstream agency. We were really, in. Um, impacted by mainstream ways of doing things, then we finally realized we really need to go back. So the first thing we did is what in the dominant culture would be referred to as a literature review. 
So what we did is we really tried to get as much information as we possibly could on what were the values before the colonists came. And we came and we read a lot about the original instructions that were given to us and actually inform all ceremonial practices. These original instructions are really important. And it really was, um, the original instructions are about relating to the world as though everything in it is equitable. That human beings and plants and animals, the elementals, water, everything is completely equitable and has a reason to be here, infused by spirit with its own um, developmental path for realizing full potential. And um, for that to happen, like even if you think about what it would take for a green being to grow to its full potential, it would need adequate water, it would need adequate soil, it would be interdependently involved with its environment. So we began to look at us as all independently involved and equitable, which the circle really shows. So then we decided that we needed to have a way of doing our prevention work in circle using these values. So the first thing we did was we took all the values and we synthesized them down in an intertribal way because in our community we're intertribal and we whittled it down to 12 different values. And it turns out um, what we did is extraordinary because uh, just in the last year or two I learned that the seven grandfather teachings are completely involved in our curriculum values. And, uh, and I, I was like astounded by that. And it's cosmologically related because the seven values also make a seven pointed star. Mm. And um, you know, when the midday lodges are the Eastern ceremonial lodges that I'm involved with now. And uh, because I'm involved now my whole community will be involved. And also I am a sun dancer. So I have sun danced in South Dakota. So there's um, a linkage now between the sun dance of the West, which those ceremonies existed and exist, you know, for, for thousands of years. And, uh, and then the Midday Lodges, which are the Midaywin on Anishinaabe. So look, those two practices are coming together east and west. Mm -hmm. So um, where I go for my Midday Lodge um, teachings, they also have um, a lodge for the Sundance as well. So the two okay. lodges are in the, in the same, they're side by side. So I guess really what I'm saying is for indigenous people, ceremonial practices are really critical for healing. And we think that really they're critical for other people's healing as well. So we do teach multiculturally because there's an intersectionality about the approach of our work that's knit into these values. Because these values, they're not like, you know, like when you hear the word respect, you think of, you know, you know sharing time or hearing people and but you don't really go into the depth of respect the way we do in our curriculum in normal discourse. Like we go into the in, inequity in housing, the inequity in, you know, and where people can live. We go into the health disparities. We go into reproductive rights. We go into, you know, like treating every single person like they have the same rights. And so therefore, you know, there's um, the discrimination is dealt with and not to mention the historical context. Like we go into all these things in a very deep way. And when we talk about balance, um, we talk about how it's not really possible to be balanced in this world when uh, people own your time. We uh, have sorted out in a very big way the impact of ownership and the objectification mm. of nature. Because now all of a sudden, it could be bought and sold. And even trees have different values assigned to them based on actually the first ones who did this were my white male property owners. And they were the only ones who could buy land, own land. 
They're the only ones who were educated. They were the only ones who were taught to read. They were the only ones who could vote. I mean, I don't even have to yeah. say what implications are going on for today. Because, right. and uh, it's interesting talking to you um, or talking um, to folks from Pennsylvania because in Lan Lancaster was where a lot of the structure was laid down. And when I visited Lancaster and when I was on the advisory board, I was, I had a lot of feelings come up uh, because yeah. and I'm, so much happened there. And I'm, I'm sitting currently on that land. Wow. I'm in Lancaster County. I'm feeling everything um, that you're sharing and really understanding, I think in new ways how the putting at the center indigenous values and ceremony and history is so critical for for work and for those of us sitting in mainstream organizations mm -hmm. to understand how that is built how that is talked about and the interconnectedness piece really is standing out to me. And I'm wondering how, how, how does focusing in and being consistent with indigenous values then become part of and support this evaluation work that I know you've been mm -hmm working on with your team f since since the beginning uh, of your work um but i'd love to hear kind of how how that is flowing well uh, i think what i'm going to say is probably true for a lot of people especially people of color um initially i was not a proponent of evaluation because i felt like oh this is the way that the government just figured out ways to not support people's work. That's what I thought at the beginning. And um, and then when I looked at traditional evaluation and it's beanie counting, you know, mm -hmm. and it's productivity, um, you know, impetus, I was thinking, really, this is really the stuff that, you know, that the dominant culture thrives upon. And I felt like it was, a lot about you know white privilege and didn't speak much to me you know but actually mm -hmm. what i found is what i needed is a new language in which to talk about evaluation yeah. because there is something about a historical context that's important around evaluation i think it needs to be rooted in a history and for us that's definitely for sure and i think it's true for other communities of color because our experience here in the United States is different. And our evaluation processes need to reflect that. So we needed a circle process. We needed a, um, a non-hierarchical model of storytelling in which to capture uh, the work. And, uh, and we needed to also address the impact that the dominant culture has had on our communities and the damage it has done and even for us to even forget some of our own things that we were really great at. And I, I will give you an, just an example of indigenous knowledge it acknowledges that there is nothing that's truly objective. When you look at something with your set of eyes and with your set of measurements, there's an element of subjectivity in that that can't be taken away. And I've heard other um, philosophers say that, like Bertrand Russell or people who are mathematic mathematicians say, you really can't measure anything completely accurately. There's some subjectivity in it. And then when you think about the transformation that you're looking for in behavior, it's the same thing. It's like in our curriculum, we really focus on listening without interrupting or judging and really fully listening and not thinking about what you're going to say before you go to speak. And we found that that encourages a lot of change because in that process, 
someone hears somebody's heart and then you then even if you don't agree with them if they're speaking from their heart and then you speak with your heart the two people talking to each other can make a third thing go on and if you understand that a third thing is always going on you can really open up you know to the highest amount of transformation possible simply by listening so we found mm -hmm. that we can capture the changes that people experience our curriculum they experience um, a change in their life on profound levels and when we um, like just to give you like it took us a long time to come up with this we came up with the question of reflecting on what has gone on in your life since the last time we met in circle you know what is it that you would like to share and in there we would get all this information about how our curriculum changed how they looked at the world so we wanted the trans uh, transformation um, of cultural you know involvement like relationships in the world itself where in the end you feel completely accountable to every single person you meet that if if you don't uh, if you see a harm and and there's nothing you do about it that that is going to impact on your humanity it's going to impact on your life so and we talk even when people are planting their gardens if you look at all plants and animals as equal to yourself when you're moving a weed out i mean is it a weed or um is it really a, a wild form of medicine and people began to garden differently and people began to spend more time with their children in the process of evaluation we found out by trial and error most of it which is the order of our curriculum because we found that if you really want for empathy and you want conflict resolution you can't start with that first we start out with a first session where we introduce people to the process and we ask them uh, to draw where they're from and who their people are and that accesses a different part of the brain and also really incredible drawings and information comes forward but you're already addressing culture you're already addressing the ancestry and you're you know you're beginning to get a historical um way of, of putting yourself into here into the united states and then we also ask people and this is not through drawing how they got their names and a lot of rich information comes out from that i mean incredible stories so and what we're doing is building a background you know we're building trust in a deeper way and we don't ask for agreements until we've gone through that process and then we do agreements and those are put on a pie plate written in a circle and it's amazing what kind of things come up in the agreements based on going through that process of identifying you know your name where you're from and who your people are very different kind of things come up then the next thing we do is peace and justice where we talk about a historical analysis of where the problems of violence came which we address as having come from the structure that got set in whereby everything got owned i mean the plants the animals um the waters and people people got owned african people got owned native peoples got removed or owned and then women were owned and their children were owned there was an objectification that set in i mean there's no way of, i mean it used to be that a woman couldn't even say no in a marriage to sexual you know activity uh, because it wasn't acknowledged in the law which is a form of ownership and the fact that women couldn't own any property really until the 1970s i think fully i mean i mean it used to be that if a woman bought a car it had to be registered in her husband's name or a man's name yeah. so anyway when you look at this i mean a lot of young people don't know this today but it's important that that's how old we were and the currency they used is money in order to put it all in place so we see capitalism as a big piece of this and um so when we talk about the um 
doctrine of discovery, which few people know about, and we address the fact that that's still in the Constitution, which means that indigenous people really can't have full sovereignty rights if, in fact, in the Constitution, it says that whatever was in place when, when England had the, owned the land here is now transferred. And it's really in the Constitution. So it's, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg had to rule based on what was in the Constitution and delight, deny land to the Tinglet people who were looking to reclaim it, you know. And yes. it's a way of making sure that the treaties never get enforced to have that in there. Because it's like, it said that all people who were not Christian um, were barbarous, savage people from whom you could take the land. And then the insuperable from, I think it's Pope Nicholas the fifth or somebody who said it, you know, who, who backed it up and said that this was uh, only Christians could own the land. It entitled people to take everything from all people of color. So those bulls are still in place, as is the do doctrine of discovery, which tells you where we are now, uh, where they're crying, you know, when they did the insurrection on the Capitol, some people were saying 1776. So with all this in place, right? So we, we set the table for here's the analysis. This is how it happened. And this is how even the land was colonized because not only did they colonize us, they also brought in their own plants from home, deforested the United States and then brought in their own plants. So there's a lot of beautiful food out here in the wild that if you know what you're doing, you, you will never starve. So then we go mm -hmm. into respect from there, which again, we talk about, we deepen and repeat a lot, but it, it's different when you ask it in a different, or through a different value. So the respect goes in the egalitarian belief that all things are equal, everything is sacred. And, uh, and, you know, all the different rights that have been taken away from people. And we talk about how we relate with each other through these, through these means. You know, do you pay attention more to someone because they got more money or because of their race? Or we talk about, there's always about equity and respect. And then we move to balance. And that's where we look at how our time is owned. You get up in the morning, your time is owned because... Now you, you have to buy your, your um, shelter and, and food. It's not just there, you know. Right. You have to, and in order to get that, you have to get this money, this third party or this paper and coinage, and you're, that person owns your time. And not only that, they impact how honest you can be because you could lose your access to all of these important things if the person in power doesn't like what you're saying, they can take away your home and and everything. They could take away your children. So we go there when we talk about this. And then we go into courage. And with courage, it, we talk about how it's important to do that, um, to intervene when you see harm um, without being attached to the result. What's important is that it needed to be said. And we talk about all the ways, you know, in which the culture doesn't really make that as possible as we'd like. And, um, and then we move to, from courage, we go into humility. And what we mean by that is that we're interdependent. Human beings are not more important than anyone else. Um, all the races are equal. Everything is equitable. Um, the circle itself is equitable. Everyone in the circle has the same uh, voice. And then we say, because of the world we live in, that we will only know if we get to be in a good place <clears throat> where we live in harmony and peace would be, and with humility, is if the minority voice is the one we most need to, to listen to. Because if they feel equitable, um, then we, we can have peace. And then we go into compassion. They're in this order, building up. And compassion is based on, and you know, on the fact that it needs to be equitable. Otherwise, it's sympathy, pity, 
They can't have a power over dynamic. To be truly compassionate with someone, you have to see it as completely equal to yourself. And if you were in that position, what would you need? You know, what would you be feeling and how would you like to be heard? And, uh, and then we move into empathy. Because empathy, by the time we get there, we're acknowledging that all of us have done harm, all of us have been harmed. And um, this makes a big difference and people begin to, you know, get through that. And then after that, we get into wisdom where we have a responsibility to share all the gifts that we have, all the knowledge we have with others without competition, because of, it's a responsibility we have that these gifts came to us through the, you know, through the spirit that lives in all things. And um, therefore, um, we're here to be of service to each other. And uh, so it's not like you hoard things so that you can have an edge. It's not, you know, that you would sabotage somebody else in order to get ahead. So we, we go into all those things. And then from wisdom, we move into the connection to the land. Because when we go into the connection of the land, we recognize that it's a being fully in its own right. And that all the plants and the animals have the same psychology that we have. And in fact, many people begin to share their extraordinary experiences they've had in nature. That the dominant culture doesn't really give you much room to speak about without uh, making a reservation for you in one of its mental health centers. You know what I mean? It's like, because yeah. spirits talk to you through the land. And that's the biggest um, source of trouble is that we can't, be enjoying um, being in the world as much as we would like because we're owing our time to someone. You know, it's just, um, and to begin to neutralize that in your heart, to make the choices based on love and connection rather and building community and beginning to neutralize all this, like beginning to form collective involvement in solidarity economies and beginning to do it, you can begin to do it. You don't have to wait for the whole government to change. Your, your community can develop its own currency to trade with each other. You know, um, it's like changing hearts. That's really what we're doing and trying to reclaim how we once lived because that's how we lived before the colonists came. And then we go into the sacredness and vision and prayer as a means of ceremony, how important ceremonies are. You know, it's really powerful for people if they come back from war time to be able to have a place in ceremony to debrief from all that, to reclaim, you know, being able to be in a civilian world, you know, with, you know, just re, just getting all of that, um, all that you had to do that was hard to do, you know, murdering people, uh, being shot at, do, you know, all these things with people you don't really know, um, all that PTSD to have a place to ceremonially work through that. Like Sundance is an amazing experience for, for doing something like that. But I've heard really astounding ways of dealing with, like if you've been raped, that you could reclaim yourself through ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of people using being in the rivers to do that and reclaiming their whole virginity even with grandmother, you know, involvement, um, sweat lodges and all these things. I know myself, I Sundance because I have early childhood trauma that I've never, no matter how much therapy I've ever had, that would always come up. So, um, and I realized that spiritually that would have to be taken away because it's in my cells and I couldn't just do that myself. And I have to say, it took me a couple of sudden dances, but I'm pretty close, you know what I mean, yeah. to to really doing that. And then sun dancing for all the children, um, not to, um, you know, be impacted for the rest of their life about trauma that's set in their cells. Well, for the ancestral, mm -hmm traumas that we're carrying in ourselves. It's really, you know, um, really healing yourself with everyone else intentionally. Like what I love about ceremony is, is the prayers aren't only for you, they're for everyone. Mm. And, um, and I learned a lot about the power of um, 
the land to speak to me through ceremony. My first vision quest I ever did is how I ended up getting my name. I vision quested by a large oak tree. It was so big, it took six people to put their arms around it. And, um, wow. it, and it spoke to me. I mean, the second day I woke up in the morning and I felt some love from that tree that was astounding. And it was across species. There's conversations we used to be able to have across species until all the nonsense of the structures got set in and all that objectification got set in. We all were able to have those kind of conversations with the animals. And um, we could still get that back, but we have to work hard to get it, you know, uh, by getting all the clutter out. But it's like the prevention in there is just so immense. I can't, like um, the first time I went to Sundance, I didn't have, like I have to do my vision quest before I go. I did not have any of the things I really needed on the land on which I live. I didn't have choked cherries. I didn't have some things. The, after I Sundanced one year, the next year, I had full grown plants with choked cherries. I had wild grapes with the seeds and I had wild apples. They were all grown up. It wasn't like possible under normal circumstances to have that present in the in a uh, in a year, but that's what land can do, and like people don't realize that, or even when they chop it down, they don't realize um, that they have trauma, and you know it's a murder. If you don't sit down and have a conversation, and if you're take you you need to look at why is that tree coming down? You know it p provides your air, it holds the roots in the ground. They collaborate under the ground. They, they communicate beautifully, all the root systems. And it really takes four years after you cut a tree down for the, for the wood. To, the energy is still in there for four years. So that's why it's better to wait to, to burn wood until after the four years is up. It burns better if the energy has been resolved. So I hope this is helping with this because then when we go into generosity, we're not talking about, oh, you know, oh, I gave, you know, blah, 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 or I donated, da, 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 da. No, we're talking about bartering, equitable systems. We're talking about a whole culture based on generosity where um, the receiver has to not feel diminished in it, that you also see the gift back. It's a, a mutual exchange yeah. then you know is with generosity and it needs to have no attachment to it like when you give it it's gone now there's no manipulation there's no expectation it's just like given and like um and then the, the last thing we do is gratitude and uh, when we do gratitude, we look at, you know, again, it's all about community building. It's all about uh, responsibility to each other, the whole curriculum. It includes all the intersections. And we did this, a group of survivors over a long period of time. And then to evaluate this beautiful process, we went through, you know, like figuring out how we were going to get the data so we record, so what we do is we, we record the, um, the reflection round, we record the question, the initial response to the question, and then we record the transformation, the, the very last question is what have you heard that surprises you, transforms you and mo moved you, if anything. So we ask that, these three things, and then we transcribe them so there's no name attached anymore. And, uh, and then um, they go through this now prism of this. Uh, we use Michael Quinn Patton's um, principle-based evaluation, which fits because we're working with values. And yes. so when the principle-based, and Morgan J. Curtis told us about that, and Patrick Lemon, he's been invaluable as well. They work very well as a team. 
when we met, which have been a lot of meetings over more than five years now, we meet, we meet in circle. All the community trainers that have been using the, the, the model, the curriculum, are at the table and we actually go in a circle and they love it. Morgan and Patrick love being part of it's the great. circle. And we go around yes. and we share what we've experienced teaching it. Um, what do we think needed to be tweaked? You know, how would we do the questions? How can we evaluate this? So everyone would have input into that process over these last five years. Then we tried out using um, you know, the data using Michael Quinn Patton's um, stuff, which took a long time for us to get it. And then it yeah. took a while to come up with the questions. <laughs> then it took um, actually going to see someone else give a, um, a presentation on it at the National Sexual Assault Conference. When we went there, we had been struggling for a while and everything just clicked. Then we went from oh, there. That's... <laughs> it's like we went, we we just went from there, and now we have this beautiful graphic, which I'll share, that you'll be able to um, have, you know, to to show someplace. But Morgan came up with it. We struggled mightily, all of them. Like the evaluators were struggling too, because we were like, "Oh my God, you know, like there's a lot of change happening here. How can we document this?" Yes. And of course, the, the qualitative, it would, it would say what was that. But to have like, you know, percentages and quantitative data, that was the biggest part of the struggle. And they said, that's our job. That's our job. But we all mightily went into it. And, uh, and sure enough, though, they did come up with it. And we just love it. And we're about to really put it into practice now. But I mean, really, let's see. You know, we've only been in existence like six years. I guess that's still quite an accomplishment to come it up is. with a whole different model, a whole our own curriculum based on indigenous values and our own evaluation tool that yeah. we're developing to share, you know, with other people, um, especially folks of color. I really think this, this can really work. And... Um, and I'm really happy for all the resources. I got to say, the, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center was really instrumental in all of our work, actually. So we're a big village, you know, all across the country yes. trying to come up with these things. And there were all these research, um, you know, I was fortunate to be part of like research development going on. And I mm -hmm. saw the trial and error in that, too. I remember having to scrap one whole thing and then go into a whole nother model. I mean, the, and the, the leadership development coming out of being able to teach the curriculum to then others who then teach the curriculum has been really an, an amazing process. And, um, and yet it's copyrighted. And, and actually, we feel bad about that. But the dominant culture stuff is um, not something that you can easily just get rid of with that you know what i mean because there are people who would take your curriculum and sell it yes. and then they wouldn't necessarily be in keeping with how it's supposed to go like with fidelity to it and uh so i think we're working on that pretty well too <laughs> coming up with a means um you know to have like some i hate to use the word control over the how it's used but to make sure that it isn't like appropriated in bad ways i guess appropriated mm -hmm. would be the word to use and people have asked a lot at the conferences um about appropriation of this curriculum and i said no i if we don't appropriate like if it's if if people of color are learning about dominant culture it's called assimilation right but when it's mm -hmm. our culture that we're sharing, all of a sudden it's appropriation. I said, all you need to do is acknowledge where you got it from. And that you were trained, you know, by the people who whose work you're using. And that they would be happy that you were doing it. And like, I remember saying that at one of the conferences, 
where someone asked about appropriation, I said, I want you to use circles. I really want you to, uh, to take these materials and use them. I said, you just um, have to acknowledge where you got it from. And this native woman stood up. I'm like, uh oh, what is she going to say to me? <laughs> and she came and put a purple shawl around me and said, you know, that she was just happy to hear that. And um, and a lot of the indigenous elders, by the way, the way we really see it is that we need to be equitable across all races. If you're not going to have racism, then all the races have to be equitable with each other. Which means that those of us who've been harmed need to acknowledge that harm, but be in a place to form another way of being and teach our children some different things. And then the same, like if people have been born with privilege and advantages, they need to acknowledge that and then to not operate from that place um, so that everyone is equitable. So it's all about equity. And uh, the only way, um, I could see that we'll all be there and is if in fact all cultures are intentionally forming communities where we're actually equitable. Um, yeah. And I think, I think talking about being intentional is really critical and, you know, the principles focused evaluation approach has really resonated with a lot of people doing sexual assault, sexual mm -hmm. harassment, and sexual violence prevention work. Um, and that community care that you've talked so much about that is grounded in wanting to support healing at the individ individual level, but also at that community level, because we are experiencing community violence. It is as well as individual violence. Um, you've provided some wonderful examples and a lot of tips and permission for folks to take a look at <laughs> what you've done. Um, but do you have any other tips for people that are developing culturally specific evaluations in their own communities and for the folks that may be supporting culturally specific programs and their evaluations, but might not be part of that community? Well, the first thing that came to mind when you asked me that question was involve your community in the evaluation. Uh, people who are using the tools that you're evaluating, involve them in that. Um, look first as to whether it's giving it you the information you need. And uh, I found that people began to be excited about evaluation. And that was a major thing to have people in. And people feel really respected when they're involved in developing evaluation tools. And have the tool reflect the work you're trying to measure, which mm -hmm. turns out this model works really, really well. Uh, because it's based on like dawn, a common sense thing that everything that we do comes out of our values and principles. Translating that into behavior, the, uh, you know, just learning about the behaviors reflect the value. What you see is a reflective and like making that little connection. I really think that was a deep, uh, deep knowing that oh yeah, there's a seamlessness about that. And if you're going to make changes, then there's the place you need, the change needs to happen. Because the behavior will reflect it, you know, reflect it, you know, what's going on. And then you'll know that you really were effective when those begin to really shift and you get, get, get to see it, you know, so... Yeah, so I just think inv involving uh, people as much as possible, um, let it expand before you contract it. Oh, that's a good tip. Yeah, let let yeah let the ideas really you know because that that actually is probably defining everything that happened for us and like what worked and what didn't work, and not to get discouraged. The process is important, and. Um, it was like kind of like exciting. People struggle through 
uh, together. And um, that was, uh, that's a really un an important piece of uh, Michael Quinn Patton's work. Cause yeah. you know, if it's involved all around um, in everything that you do, then uh, it's, um, you change too. That's the other thing we all changed yes. by teaching the curriculum. And we decided that's an important part of the evaluation to reflect our mm -hmm. own change. And then to um, what we don't capture in the recordings, when we debrief and we have a debrief session um, as close to when the session ended as possible. Both your program and the way you're using data collection for both for participants to share their stories, but for your program to have a story and your facilitators to have a story, all of how that's building on through all of the different layers of the curriculum, it really is a growth mindset and that people are growing individually, but also growing together as that community doing that community work together. So that's really powerful people forget that each of us has a responsibility on this particular you know uh content that we have to personalize and talk about so when people teach it one of our new teachers who was like oh my god um i don't know how i'm gonna do this because <laughs> she's doing really well but it's like yes i'm you know this is the content Mm -hmm. And we don't want you to just read it off a piece of paper. And the other beautiful thing about our curriculum, and it's true, a lot of indigenous people will tell you for us, it's not about facts per se. We don't care if it was a muskrat or a little squirrel that went down to the bottom of the ocean to get bring up some earth to form, you know, the turtle, uh, you know, to get the land on the turtle for sky women to land upon. What counts is that a little tiny animal went down and gave its life doing it and mm -hmm. came up with the, you know, and when bigger, more powerful animals weren't successful, it, what counted was that value, that the heart and the intent got that little one down there to bring up what was needed for the community. Um, it's the story that's important. The value is what's lived through time. So I guess I'm, go a long way to tell you that our curriculum simply by changing the question you have a whole different conversation like it's different if i say how does peace and justice um affect um you know safety of children in the community if you say how does peace and justice affect transgendered people in the community the whole conversation is going to revolve around that same question mm -hmm. i mean it's the same the content of the curriculum is good for whatever you're talking about. So you could talk about elders, you could talk about, and that's another fascinating piece. So lately we've been doing, uh, adding racial equity to our conversation, mm -hmm. you know, through a racial justice lens. How can we keep children safe in the community? You know, how does respect, you know, impact safety for children in the community from a racial justice lens? Mm -hmm. This way, then, you know, we bring in all those intersections and disparate experience that people have. So that's the other, and that's an important piece of our evaluation process, too, to see how those questions are differently answered when you add racial justice to it. Yes. Like two different kinds of, and um, and actually people are more comfortable when you don't add racial justice to it. Because I actually think, um, like, uh, some of the uh, white people in the group wouldn't be having as much of a struggle if you didn't add the racial justice piece. Because the conversation brings in all the inequities. And, like, if, you know, if you were talking about safety of children and didn't add that to it, it's a different conversation. It is. And I am hearing from from different folks around the country that are are building their curriculums to be more centered on those discussion, discussions of racial equity and they're actually seeing some of their outcomes 
the behavior changes, uh, attitude changes Mm -hmm. around equity are having, like, like they're really seeing a difference, Mm -hmm. even though there may, there may be some slowness to the conversations or it may be more challenging. They're actually seeing that their groups are changing, um, more quickly when that, that, that opportunity is centered. So that's really interesting that, um, how you all are, are bringing in and able to shift and grow your curriculum. The work that you're doing gives me hope. It, it helps with me reframing, thinking about things in different ways. And I'm just, I feel really lucky that you've continued to share about your process with us. Um, I just wish you... I was younger because, uh. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, I'm, I'm a study in the, really, it's all, only in my late years that I'm really beginning to find my voice in this, in this community of, you know, I'm going to be 75 this year. Yeah. You know, that's a, three quarters of a century my god it's like Mm -hmm. but i'm at my i'm at my best right now at a time when the dominant culture would be farming me out you know what i'm saying right (laughs) but in my community it's true that though when you're older that's when you you are you know you have the most impact is when you are my age it's like a kind of a reverse from the dominant culture but yeah, in uh, some of my dealings with the dominant culture, though, I think they think, you know, that um, actually none of the people that I know, because like in my state, I talk about survivorship, you know, the organization, and we're building in a lot of survivorship, like through practices. But it's like, you know, um, if I feel comfortable that if something happened to me tomorrow, that um, the kind of uh, data management system we have and the involvement we have that people would be able to go on without me, you know, mm-hmm. that we really miss me a lot. And, you know, and I probably, if I was on the other side, I probably wouldn't be missing anyone anymore. I'd be going back to my ancestral village. Well, you definitely have unique knowledge to share and I value the opportunity to hear from you, but you're right. Maybe we need to be um, organizing some, some podcasts to specifically talk about that because I think we've seen um, where young people's voices aren't heard and where our elders' voices are often pushed out. Thank you so much, Strong Oak. This was fabulous. I really appreciate you and thank you for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate you too. So I'm, I'm uh, hoping to see you at some point in the future. For listening to this episode of Resource on the Go. For more resources and information about preventing sexual assault, visit our website at nsvrc.org. To learn more about how sexual violence prevention programs are using principles focused evaluation, check out our webinar recording with Tatiana Masters from Evaluation Specialist on the work that is happening in Washington State. You can find these and other episode resources at www.nsvrc.org slash podcasts. You can also get in touch with us by emailing resources at nsvrc.org.